Disease Ecology, Planetary Health and Human Rights, The Critical Nexus to Save Our Planet. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for uh, Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds for today, September 6th, 2023. Uh, today's topic is Disease Ecology, Planetary Health and Human Rights, and the Critical Nexus to Save Our Planet. Our speaker today is going to be uh, Dr. Daniel Bosch, Senior Advisor for Global Health Security at FIND, and the President of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Uh, for those who are interested in continuing education credits, continuing education will be provided uh, in information in the email that was sent or in the, the chat. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bosch. Thanks, Mike, um, and thanks to everyone for joining. Really happy to, to be here and appreciate you spending your, let's see, I think it's a Wednesday afternoon for you up here in Geneva. It's uh, in the evening already for me, but appreciate you spending the time. Um, I chose this fairly grandiose title, and you may be thinking like, what the, what, what is he gonna do with this, trying to put all these things together? And I hope that it, it stimulates a little bit of some provocative thoughts for, for all of us on, in, in the next hour or so. We'll, we'll see if I succeed in that. Slide. Determinants of health. A Venn diagram with three overlapping circles, biomedical, social, political. The center where all three sectors intersect is shaded in red. The underlying um, premise will not be surprising to anyone who's on the line here um, today, and that is, of course, that the determinants of health we tend at CDC, and uh, I'll note that I was also at CDC Special Pathogens, and we'll use some examples from my time there. Uh, we tend to often focus on kind of the more biomedical parts of that, sometimes the social part, um, rarely the political part, but what underlies all of this is really um, the case that I'll try to make today is, is a human rights framework that we need to go back to and it's really our only way of success, ultimately, in what we try to do. Slide of a scatter plot graph from 1880 to 2020, with temperature anomaly the y-axis, entitled, Global Mean Estimates Based on Land and Ocean Data. The dots are labeled annual mean and a red line through the dots labeled low is smoothing. In 1880, the one stars at 0, 0.0, and with a few fluctuations, by 2020 the line has risen to approximately 1.0. The, the global warming part of this, I doubt that there's anyone on the line that I need to convince that global warming is real and this is happening. Temperatures are going up. Obviously, we're seeing this in this summer of where the planet is burning and, and so many things happening in other places, but um, around the world. Slide. Planetary health. Anthropogenic degradation. But it's really not just a question of, of the temperature. Really, what we're talking about is planetary health and what, what I would phrase as anthropogenic degradation. So it's the, the various ways that we are degrading our planet. And that comes either directly or indirectly from a number of different effects. Just a few that are here. Of course, there is climatic variation and, and temperature change, the population growth, and all, all of these are interactive, of course. Um, we're seeing explosive population growth through the next few decades, at least. Uh, equitable access to basic services and, and drastically skewed economics around the world. Um, severe habitat perturbation, poor, inadequate political leadership in many areas of the world. And so these conspire to come together to really bring us a, a very difficult situation that is not solved only with biomedical advances. And what's the consequence of this anthropogenic degradation? Of course, mostly we'll focus here on the risk of infectious diseases. That's what I focus on. And the, because we have this degradation, we have adaptive or maladaptive changes in human behavior that put people at risk. We have impacts of temperature change and these very uh, many myriad things that I've mentioned on the pathogen itself or on the reservoir or the vector. And then we, when we think about prevention, we tend to really think about secondary prevention, although we don't always think about that in that way. And what I would state here today is that secondary um, prevention is really what we do most of the time and thinking about science and medicine and understanding the disease ecology so that we can mitigate risk. But the primary prevention actually is assurance of health as a human right. And not, none of this, of course, is to diminish the impact of everything that probably most of you do every day and what I do every day that does focus on the science and biomedical part of this. But um, I've come to realize, that, of course, that it's really not enough if our goal is actually to improve human health and an ambitious goal of, of making sure that our planet um, can continue in a healthy and happy way. It's Slide. Nature climate change. Analysis. 
article entitled, Over Half of Known Human Pathogenic Diseases Can Be Aggravated by Climate Change. Site. HTTPS, slash slash doi.org slash 10.1038 slash S41558-022-01426-1. There's lots of research these days. I'm looking at the interaction of climate change and, um, and different infectious diseases. This is a paper published relatively recently. Over half of known human pathogenic diseases can be aggravated by climate change. There are places, of course, where this will increase. There are places where it will decrease. Um, we, we often talk about how a place will get warm enough so that a mosquito can now exist that didn't exist before. There are places where it will get too warm that for that mosquito to exist. So it, it's not a, um, all in one direction. But nevertheless, we are seeing that there's a, an enhancing risk as our planet um, not only gets warmer, but that we have, of course, increasing travel and some of the other impact factors that I mentioned on the previous slide. Slide. Pathogenic diseases aggravated by climatic hazards. Source, Mora et al. Nat Klim Chang. 2022, 12 open brace 9 close brace, 869-875. And, and I won't go into the science of this. You can look this up. Many of you, you probably study this yourselves. The pathogenic diseases aggregated, sorry, aggravated by climatic hazards. And there, there's quite a few. Um, as I say, this can be from the effect on the pathogen itself and uh, its longevity, for example, and, and warmer temperatures. It can be through the changing patterns of the vectors or the reservoirs. So um, this is a very active field of study and needs to continue. But again, I'll, I'll make the case that it's not enough. Of course, what we're primarily concerned about and what I'll refer to here today are zoonoses. There's a whole other um, a whole other thing that's happening in terms of, of really an ongoing pandemic of AMR and uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria. I won't touch upon that really anymore, but we'll we'll talk about zoonoses. And it's you don't have to be a scientist to understand that as temperatures change, as we build a road, that this photo through the Peruvian Amazon, as we change these habitats or go into caves or mines and get in contact with different animals such as bats, that of course risk is going to change. Slide. Public health emergencies of international importance, 21st century. And consequently, if we look, um, this is just an example of this, fairly obvious, but if we look at the major um, and major infectious disease events that have happened so far in our relatively brief century, they have all been zoonotic um, pathogens. And so we had the SARS-CoV-1 virus in 2003. Some of you remembered uh, that. I was still at CDC at that time, spent a lot of time in in Vietnam. Um, we used to think of that as sort of a, a big event. It was a very big event economically. It was not a big event. It, it, it considered a drop in the ocean now of 8,421 uh, 8, cases. The H1N1 influenza a virus, of course, um, with various components derived from swine and birds as well as humans. And then Ebola virus, which as far as we know, this has not really been uh, clearly elucidated, but probably has a bat as its reservoir. And then um, SARS-CoV-2, for which we also expect the bat. So um, they, these are uh, obviously zoonoses are what we're most concerned about in the field of pandemics. Map of the world. Vaccine preventable disease outbreaks, 2008 to 2014. Source, Council of Foreign Relations Global Health Program. Different colored dots are largely concentrated in South and West Africa, Europe, United States, Middle East, and India. But it's not only pandemics and epidemics. If we look at the vaccine preventable disease outbreaks that have happened, um, this is up till the, through 2000, 2008 to 2014, you know, these, these are also happening. And there's, of course, no reason for these to happen. We've already solved most of this scientifically. We have the product. We just are not getting the product to the right people for various reasons. And so this is not an issue um, primarily of science. It's an issue of many other components that are sociopolitical and, again, I would submit that the, the the lack of ensuring health as a human right is one of the primary um, Slide. Research article. Poverty in the Time of Epidemic, a Modeling Perspective. Source, Zahaz Rahneman and Jeldtoft Jensen. PLOS 1. 2020, 15 open brace, 11 close brace, E0242042. Reasons for this. It's also clear that when we look at epidemics and pandemics, this is a modeling perspective, but there are other studies as well that um, it's not 
but it's not evenly distributed. Risk is not evenly distributed across the population. There's both a cumulative infection, or cumulative infection rates and current infection rates are systemically higher for the poor. Um, and then a key point for this um, is that improving the inequity is not only better for the poor, but it's also better for the non-poor. And so even if someone wanted to take a, if you will, a completely selfish approach to infectious diseases and say, why should I care of what's happening somewhere else in the world? Um, actually, your safest thing for you, even if you're most concerned and your only concern is you and your family, actually, you do have a reason to be concerned, even if it's not an ethical one or uh, caring for another person. Slide. Viral hemorrhagic fevers. Phylaviridae, Ebola virus disease, Marburg virus disease, Areniviridae, Lassa fever, South American HF open brace Argentine, Bolivian, Venezuelan, Brazilian close brace, Bunyaviridae, Flobovirus, Rift Belay fever, Narovirus, Crimean Congo HF, Hanadavirus, HF with renal syndrome, Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, Flaviviridae, Yellow fever, Dengue HF, Chiasa nerve forest disease, OMS KHF. I'd like to run through a few examples in the field that I worked in for quite a, a long time now, viral hemorrhagic fevers in different contexts. And um, uh, as, as I mentioned, was there with you at CDC, and many of you from CDC on the line today, I think, and uh, working in viral special pathogens and outbreaks and, and research in this field. And want to take you back to um, an outbreak that happened while I was at CDC and that we deployed with a number of people from CDC and, and other in, institutions and organizations, and um, Bob Swanepoel in South Africa and the NCID and then a number of people from WHO. And this was an outbreak of Marburg virus disease that happened in kind of the twin towns of Durba and Watsa in the north, um, let's see, northeastern part of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a little bit further north um, than the, the big outbreak, a relatively big outbreak of Ebola that happened um, with the epicenter of North Kivu province in um, DRC a few years back. Photo of dwellings with thatched roofs. A group of dark-skinned young children mostly wearing Western-style clothing gather for the camera. 1998 to 2000. This is a very, very remote area. You can see um, this is a, a photo. Um, if you speak French, you, you see the sign Centre de Santé de, de la France. So this was the reference center at Centre de Chalon de Durba, so the isolation, isolation center for care for patients with Durba at that time. You can get an idea from just looking at that, that it was not a particularly developed place. This was also, I should say, in an era really before um, groups like MSF and Alima came in to provide uh, care for patients with viral hemorrhagic fevers. Slide. Filoviruses. Marburg virus. Ebola virus, with subgroups Sa'ir, Sudan, Thai forest, Bundabugyo, Reston, Bombali. Two images, one a green ball with blue hair like tendrils reaches out. The second, a rope with a twisted knot at its center. And for those of you unfamiliar, unfamiliar, with Marburg virus, this is from the same family as Ebola virus, um, causes a, a disease qu um, quite similar to Ebola virus disease and the, the pathogenic Ebola viruses that you see here. There's some um, taxonomy that uh, seems to be changing by the hour with uh, with viruses, but you get the idea. And, and this is a, a virus that's still around. We very recently had a, not a large, fortunately, but an outbreak of Marburg virus disease in Equatorial Guinea just a few months back. Two color photos. In the upper left, an aerial view of a village situated on a large plain, with bush land and mountains in the distance. In the low right, a photo of a village on the horizon, with large boulders and shrubs at the camera location. And, but back here, um, this is a shot taken from the plain coming in. Uh, you can see that the, the, this is back in the film days, and the film which actually, I think, went, underwent some, some some degree of damage and just some of the screening at airports on the way out of um, DRC months after the event. But you can see that this is a relatively remote event uh, area. And this was happening during the Congolese Civil War. Um, we had to negotiate through WHO to actually get permission to deploy to the site from the rebels that were holding this, again, these twin towns of Durba and Watsa and not shoot down the plane as we were flying in. Slide. Durba, DRC. Marburg Outbeak associated with gold mine, 1998 to 2000. Two photos, on the left, the deep quarry with water in it and the mine shafts indicated at the top of a hill. On the right, 
workers standing in the quarry, outside a small entrance to the underground mine. Later, inside a tunnel, a person dressed in blue, against a wall in standing water. And, and the event that was happening was really centered um, from the investigation and it, uh, well, the early information that we had, and then the investigation that subsequently took place, centered around a gold mine. And so um, gold miners were going into these, uh, this setting, young men coming out and getting sick um, once in a while and, and, and often dying and once in a while spreading disease to family members. There was a physician who was seeing this again in this very remote area um, and put in a request for support from the Congolese Ministry of Health. Um, we recognized that that's thousands of kilometers away, the other side of the country um, during a, a civil war and they're in the region held by the rebels and Kinshasa where the capital is held by the government. No support came, and after a few months, he put in another request, and having an accumulated number of miners who were dying and getting sick, and some of their family members, no, no support still, and, and ultimately, um, he came down with a similar disease and died. And at that time, um, MSF was able to get into the area and get a sample for him that came to us at CDC, and we were able to confirm this was my Marburg virus disease and then participate in the, uh, the response. And this is what you see inside of uh, the mines. This was a mine that was started in the era of the Belgian Congo and then became independent with um, BRC's independence and then formerly Zaire. Um, was held for a while uh, by different international companies. And then with the civil war, they abandoned it. And so all the formal mining went away. People were just basically strapping flashlights around their heads, the young men and going in and chipping out what they could. They were not happy. Um, the people who controlled this area were the Congolese rebel forces in conjunction with the Ugandan military. And they were not happy about some people messing with the mine. So these were the guys who stood outside the mine, basically. Five young men in Western dress. One man wearing a t-shirt and baggy athletic pants carries a semi-automatic weapon. And the, the Congolese um, basically had to pay their share. And so they would go in, and but um, they would get taxed basically in gold um, uh, from being able to, to work there. We were not able to enter the mine other than the one firm I took here. Um, we were, did not get permission from these people with the guns uh, to enter the mine. So we thought we probably should obey them. Um, that was the only real friction that we did have during the time there. Two photos. A person wearing latex gloves examines the eyes of a black worker. A white bucket of blood. Mostly our, our safety was assured by the various military and rebel forces that were there. And this is what was happening. This was a young man who um, was a miner. And um, these are all, all informal miners, I should say, with no training, and no system, basically, to support this. And he showed up um, one evening with fever and a headache. And you can see from this photo, um, that he had a little bit of subconjunctival injection in viral hemorrhagic fever, contrary to some of the popular literature that's out there. You don't bleed from the eyes. You have either injection or sometimes frank hemorrhage from the fragile capillaries underneath your uh, subject, your conjunctiva, and so can have red eyes, but you don't have any blood that is leaking out. He did have blood leak out, however, when he vomited in the middle of the night. And you can see this shrank vomit on the other side of the slide that happened. And um, this was all probably occurred within, I think he, he um, came to the small center there, maybe seven o'clock in the evening, vomited at midnight or one o'clock and died at seven o'clock in the morning. So a very, a very rapid um, um, evolution. Three medical workers wearing masks, long aprons, and blue paper medical scrubs. Disease. And as I showed you before, um, in the relatively um, sparse and, and spare setting that we had there, in Durba, we were not able to provide anything like in real care. So it was really just witnesses to his death, quite frankly. Slide. Total admissions and febrile hemorrhagic illnesses versus number of admissions, January 1991 through September 1999. Durba slash Watsa, DRC Watsa General Reference and OKIMO Hospitals. There are regular spikes I admissions except for several years following the death of a doctor and nurse when the admission were very low spiking with the arrival of a new doctor. Marking hemorrhagic syndrome began in September of 1999. Um, and, but we, we were able to do something that was illustrious, I think, um, 
from our investigation. And so this is uh, a slide of cases that we looked at. We were there and in, uh, initially we were there a couple times over a two year period, but uh, starting in, in 1998 um, through 2000, you can see those are the small black bars on the lower side of this graph. And we were able to review hospital records and see if, um, if there were cases that were consistent with viral hemorrhagic fever or um, Marburg virus disease previously. And a couple of different things that we found, first of all, that villagers and, and clinicians in the area recognized a disease that they called syndrome de Durba or Durba syndrome, Durba again being the village where we were, of people, minors who got sick and died, and, and we were able to find people who had that, um, that clinical profile, although of course there was no laboratory confirmation. So it seemed that this was really an endemic area for um, Marburg. But there were some other things that were um, illustrative um, for, from this as well. So you can see that the death of the doctor and actually a nurse that the doc, uh, was in contact with the, with the doctor, they, they both actually uh, was in contact with the patient, excuse me, they both treated a woman who had um, an abortion and uh, a spontaneous abortion. There was quite a bit of blood, both got sick and died. And you can see once that happened, that there was really um, the, the patient care and the presentation to the center really fell off because there were no clinicians to see them. Later on, there was an arrival of, the, of a new doctor, but you could see really some trends that um, when the Civil War heated up a little bit later, then that um, made it difficult for people to come to the uh, care center. So the, the point that I'd like to make here is that we're not just thinking about this, or it would be incorrect for us to think that the major problem here is just Marburg. There are very many other problems and very many factors that um, impact on Marburg. Slide. The New England Journal of Medicine. Original article. Marburg hemorrhagic fever associated with multiple genetic lineages of virus. We were able to show on the scientific side um, something that was very interesting, that there were multiple um, genetic lineages circulating at the same time in that area. That was very unusual at the time. When we look at filovirus outbreaks, for the most part, they're um, very uh, very homogeneous in terms of their genetic sequence. Um, if they get very large, like the one that we had in, uh, in 2013 through 16, of course, you have many opportunities for mutations to accumulate. But on small outbreaks, we don't have a lot of heterogeneity. In this case, we did have nine circulating lineages, and that's indicative that there was probably primary infections going on rather than continue just a, a series of secondary infections from, from we, we presume, bats in the mind that had a um, different uh, chance to have a mutated virus and some heterogeneity of viruses and then having primary infection of humans. Slide. Flooding of mine and end of Marburg outbreak in 2000. Two photos. On top, the flooded quarry pit. On the bottom, a black and white photo of workers standing on steps carved into the sides of the flooded quarry. Later, slide, studies of reservoir hosts for Marburg virus. Three photos of researchers harvesting bat specimens. And interestingly, um, the mine, which again had no no real control in any organized way, no company looking after it, no no educated people who were um, looking after this that usually pump out the, the groundwater. And so that was not happening. And by the end of 2000, um, the whole area had flooded and there were no more cases of Marburg virus disease after that time. And so really indicative that the mine was the source. And so then before that happened, we were able to go back and do some of the work that um, I'm not really formally trained to do because I'm a medical doctor, but nevertheless worked a lot in zoonotic diseases. And people over the years showed me how to trap various animals and, uh, and to collect samples. And so this was um, co collecting. Um, these were Egyptus, uh, Rosettus aegyptus, or the Egyptian fruit bats that were um, a suspected reservoir of Marburg virus. We did not isolate the virus um, at this um, event, but we were able to have some PCR positives and the virus was subsequently isolated in other places. And it's fairly clear that um, Rosetus aegypticus is the natural reservoir for Marburg these days. And so this was a very productive investigation, but- uh, What is the cause of this Marburg virus outbreak? Um, you know, so what was the cause of this outbreak? Well, of course, Marburg virus, but you know, where did Marburg virus come? Well, it came from the bats. And so well, that was the, the cause, but what, why were the, was there exposure to the bats? That was entrance into the mine, but why did people enter into the mine? Well, that was because 
they had no choice of economic hardship. There was nothing else, no other way to make money. And, and why was that? Well, that was the, the Civil War. And where did the Civil War come? Um, of course, the, the global appetite for, for precious minerals. And this is um, you know, an example of gold, but we could look at a lot of other precious minerals where a similar thing is, is happening. So, so I think we, we need to get back to thinking about this. And, and, and it's not wrong, of course, to recognize all those different steps where we need to try to um, intervene, but we need to recognize what's going on underneath. Final point on this slide. Health is a human right. And until we recognize and intervene on, on a broader scale, we will not be successful really in what we'd like to do, or at least um, I, that in, in an ideal way successful in what we'd like to do in curbing infectious diseases and others as well. And so uh, similar question, parallel questions, um, what, what's the prevention of this outbreak and this disease? Well, prevent access to the mine, but how do you do that when people don't have any other any other way to make money? Well, you could try, try to protect against bats when entering the mine and, and then provide better care to, to sick, sick, sick persons, but we come back to needing to stop the Civil War and we come back to the Civil Wars um, fueled by that appetite for, for precious minerals. And so again, it gets to be a, a much larger question uh, that we have to um, address or think about at least as we interact in these settings. And it comes back to health as a human right. Slide. Ebola virus, sensationalism, science, and human rights. Bausch and Clowerty. And it's a very similar thing. I, mean, so I, I chose an example of Marburg. I could choose quite a, quite a few different diseases, Ebola and various settings in Lhasa and hunter viruses and quite a few other things. But um, so this human rights underpinning, I think, is something that is really there. If you want to um, really delve into this, um, the late Paul Farmer wrote a really good book about the, the, under the, that allowed Ebola to, to um, basically take off in Sierra Leone um, a few years back. Book cover. Fevers, Feuds and Diamonds, Ebola and the Ravages of History. Paul Farmer. Fever, Swedes, and Diamonds. I would encourage you to, to check that out. A photo of child with inflamed eye. Lassa fever. Then photo PF rodent with two parallel rows of teats running the length of the underbelly. Mastomys natalensis, or multi-mammate rat. I, I won't go into um, a long um, description, but I, I thought I would just mention Lassa fever. You know, so we could make some similar things, some similar parallels. This was... This is a disease that we see more in endemic form, um, spread by a type and maintained by a type of rodent. We do know that in general, the reservoir for this disease, um, a, a rodent called Mastomys natalensis that we find across West Africa, also called the, the multi-mammate rat, which you can tell, um, see the reason why from the underside of this female animal in, in Sierra Leone. And um, again, you know, something associated with a different type of mining in Sierra Leone, and, and this was diamond mining that um, fueled um, a lot of other loss of fever outbreaks, but of course fueled a very severe civil war and spent a lot of time um, in Sierra Leone and Liberia during this time, but much much of it with the United Nations forces that were um, of course there to try to keep the peace, but also on occasion getting themselves um, loss of fever. Sierra Leone. First set of photos, people panning for diamonds in brackish water. Second set, a tank and helicopter. Third set, hantaviruses, a rodent. Check x-ray and image of virus. And then uh, just a quick example of hantaviruses. Um, this is also a rodent-borne virus. Um, uh, I won't go through all the details, but this, is, uh, this was an investigation of an outbreak in um, Bolivia in um, probably 2003, I want to say. Attended campsite in a clearing. Text. Sugarcane worker camp Minero, Bolivia. Oligorizomies, ad prevalence 8%. Sequence ID Rio Mamor 90%. Sugarcane workers, uh, migrant workers who were coming from the highlands from the Paz and, and coming into the, the lowland, what was um, Amazon forest. You can see in this photo, really. So what in, in the foreground with the tarps are their transient houses um, where they just stay to uh, cut sugarcane. They'll stay in those those tarps and pens basically for a few days until they have to move on to other places to cut more sugar cane and just massive, massive fields of monoculture. In the background, you can see on the border where there's still some forest in the Amazon. And so these um, these workers in the sugar cane camp um, who were, of course, this is really backbreaking work, um, all done with machetes. There's no machinery here. 
and um, lots of food around the, the rodents will also like the, the vestiges of the sugar cane that's harvested. And um, so a lot of rodent interactions and we were able to um, define some of the ecology basically of different hantaviruses that circulate in these settings. And so it doesn't take, um, I think you can get the, the message fairly easily, even if you don't work in this field, that it doesn't take too many outbreak responses of our hemorrhagic fevers to understand that sure, this virus is important, but um, there's a lot of other things going on that are allowing this virus to, to circulate. We ultimately need to address those. Slide comparing equality to equity. Equality shows three people of different heights using the same sized box to look over a fence. One cannot see over the fs. Inequity, we have those same people using different size boxes. The tallest person has given his box to the shortest one, so now everyone can see over the fence. And so we get into issues of equality and equity, and I'll turn now to, to thinking more about that. But 85% um, of the world's population live in low and middle income countries, and significant poor and marginalized populations are in high income, income uh, countries as well. And so we have very significant um, equity issues, even though we have some great tools lately. And so uh, we have vaccines, but we this is a, uh, I was fortunate to get um, the, the Merck Ebola vaccine during the Ebola outbreak in, in, uh, in the Congo a few years ago. Photo of the speaker in a small clinic. And um, so we have some, some great tools that are coming out for these sorts of problems and these sorts of emerging viruses, but nevertheless, it doesn't seem like we have any dirt of emerging viruses or necessarily gaining rapid control. And so um, even though we have the tools, um, we have a lot of challenges. Slide. Find the Global Alliance for Diagnostics. And I'll, I'll come to, I, you know, I, I presently work at FIND. Many of you may be unfamiliar with FIND. FIND works in, in diagnostic development um, for a lot of different things. I work in uh, for pandemic threats. Find works from the beginning to the end, if you will, and so early phase concept stages of for diagnostics and working with industry partners, but then through with partners in the field, basically to get those products into the right places in the right hands at the right time. And um, one of the things that has come out through the work of the, of the Lancet Commission a few years ago now, maybe a year ago, um, is that the, the unaddressed diagnostic gaps are massive. So 50% of patients do not get diagnosed. And, and so you can see there uh, just some examples for TB, HIV, hepatitis C. So um, the reality is that half the people in the world who are sick and dying don't know what they're sick and dying of. Sometimes there are technical issues there and that we just don't have the right test, but often we actually do have the right test. And, and as I pointed out earlier, we have quite a few outbreaks of vaccine preventable illnesses. We have quite a few people who are sick and dying of um, of syndromes that we know what they are and we know how to diagnose them and may know how to treat them or even prevent them, but nevertheless, the right tools are not getting to the correct place. So again, it's not all about the science. And this just is an example of it, mo most of the examples that we've thought about and have been in the news over the last few years have been COVAX and ability of, of COVID vaccines, obviously a huge inequity there, but um, the same thing happened with diagnostics. Slide building TH Act. Accelerator. Despite the work to ensure supply, the access gap continues to grow. Basically, you can see here the, the red line of increasing um, increasing diagnostics available to people in high income countries, but really staying extremely low throughout in, uh, in low income countries. So while many of us were thinking about how can we get a vaccine and how can we get a therapeutic if we may have uh, COVID, um, most people or many people in low and middle income countries we're thinking, how can I even get a test? Uh, I do want to mention um, a key underlying point for all this, and that is access to care. And so for all elements that we might think about for pandemic threats, and knowing what's going on and what the next pandemic might be, or even um, or for more uh, endemic diseases that we're familiar with, it doesn't matter what therapeutic we have, what vaccine we have, what diagnostic we have, the person doesn't have access to huge inequities across the world um, with access to care that we need to be cognizant of and advocate for. Slide. Universal health recovery and health emergency response, two sides of the same coin. One, long-term goals. Universal health coverage, expand primary care testing to combat diseases that disproportionately affect vulnerable populations. Two, 
health emergencies, strength and diagnostic surveillance and response systems to contain outranks and improve pandemic preparedness, align with the One Health approach. <clears throat> I'll come back here now to um, some of the good news, if you will, that, uh, as I mentioned, the technology, what's clear from COVID and clear from the things that have been happening in the last few years, the technology is incredible. So if we look pre-COVID pandemic, and what were the diagnostic tools that were available at home or in a primary care setting? They were very few, right? And so you thought, of, okay, if you're sick, you need to go um, at least to your primary care setting. You might need to go to a secondary or tertiary care hospital and get your blood taken or whatever sample it may be, and then wait for a relatively high-tech diagnostic um, to be done. And that might take a few days. And so this is drastically changing. We're seeing all sorts of things come onto the market or innovative approaches that are really changing and, um, and giving people options at home, options at a, at a primary care level. And these include some um, things at a relatively low price that are robust and amenable, or at least soon amenable in low and middle income countries. And so for example, multiplex diagnostics, respiratory panels for a few dollars that will be seven or eight plex and get uh, diagnostic for, for seven or eight different viruses. And so this is, um, you know, really quite quite optimistic about where this is going. Slide, the coming explosion in new POC molecular platforms, connected diagnostics and interoperable systems for data management, data aggregation and data sharing for surveillance. Then, game-changing technology advances. And then there's all the newer stuff, right? Who knows what this will bring, but artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and wearables and mobile devices and CRISPR technology. And so the, the technology has been and continues and I think will continue to be incredible in our world. Slide. Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Adopted and proclaimed by the General Assembly of the Niter Nations on the 10th day of December 1948. Article 25. But we come back to this. And so this is the, the, the fundamental challenge that we have. We have this great technology, but can we assure people's rights to health and use the technology in a productive way? This is Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that um, was passed um, by the UN General Assembly in 1948. Everyone has the rights to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services. Admittedly, a very high bar. I don't think any of us would say that uh, all these rights are assured. And there are many questions, of course, of... Uh, of who assures them and how that happens. We can get into that in the discussion. And so to, to conclude, um, I don't have the time there in front of me actually, so I think we're, we're okay with time. But in, in conclusion, so modern times have brought unparalleled scientific progress, which holds a promise for, for a, a safe planet for everyone. However, the climate change and anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic de degradation and and infectious diseases still can um, continue to threaten us and disproportionately affect the tourist, poorest populations. We generally understand and have the tools to protect the planet from most infectious diseases, including pandemics. Um, and we're at a crossroads, really, of technological development and equitable access and assuring um, that what threatens us all and our planet that we can confront it. Um, and then the lack of insurance of health is a human right including equitable distribution of scientific benefits and the universal access to healthcare threatens to undermine scientific achievement. So a key question basically summarizing, can we ensure that health as a human right and achieve, can we assure health as a human right and achieve equitable production and distribution of the fruits of 21st century technology, vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, other um, things as well uh, that are presently disproportionately owned and distributed to the wealthiest nations and individuals. So when we look at some of the things that are there to approach this, um, and so, so you, you may be familiar with that there's a process going on by the WHO um, to try to think about how to, how do we detect and report pandemics or epidemics and um, change basically uh, so that we can have a more responsible system, pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. And so many talking about this, um, if you look at the proposed documents, human rights are mentioned just twice, actually, and really in a very general way. World Health Organization. World's Health Assembly agrees to launch process to develop historic global accord on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. 
And part of this, of course, is because um, people are more comfortable talking about equity. Equity is an important principle, but it really has the notion of a voluntary one. Doing something that's equitable because you, you want to share, you want to be kind. Um, rights are more challenging to people because rights, of course, uh, are just that, rights. And so that implies an obligation. And so people get more uncomfortable. But I think we have to enter into those sorts of discussions in order to really succeed. So I'd like to end with a, a few last slides, but action points. My, my um, call to action is not that everyone should stop being a scientist or that everyone should not do the work that many of you do that focuses on science and, and medicine and, and healthcare in, in different ways. You know, that's extremely important and we need to continue to produce that evidence and to intervene in, in the ways that we can. So it, it's not really that um, everyone needs to stop and, and go get a job with Amnesty International. It's great if you do, but uh, it's not what I do either. Um, but nevertheless, um, a, a filter, using a filter and be cognizant of human rights uh, and, and all you do, I think, is extremely helpful to me. And, and I, it's something that I try to teach to all the the medical students and PhD and other graduate students that I work with and um, instill in them because I think it's the, the right way to think about this. Um, number two, be a witness and share your testimony. And so even though we are in an era where um, there's a lot of questions about the scientific process and a lot of, um, you know, the infodemic where we have people who don't believe science and don't want to believe science, but nevertheless, we're still in a situation in most areas of the world where you as a scientist are a respected a voice. And so sharing your, your news, your data, and being an advocate um, for not only your science, but an advocate for human rights and the underlying problems is an extremely important element of what you do and can do. Advocating for universal health coverage and access to health services always needs to be done because not, nothing really makes any sense if we don't do it. Thinking about the entire value chain and being proactive on social and political determinants as well as the scientific ones. This is really kind of a repetition, I suppose. But what I mean about thinking of the, the value chain is that if our goal is actually to improve health of an individual or a population, there are many different points in that value chain. None of us can work at all those points. So people do the basic science works so that's necessary to produce vaccine candidates and then clinical trials to test vaccine candidates and then implementation and working with Gavi and, and others to, to um, procure and, and implement the vaccines as an example. Um, so no, none of us can really work on everything, but understanding and uh, thinking about that value chain the whole way through, I think, can help us to um, advocate in, a, in an appropriate way. And then, as I mentioned, voting and being an advocate for human rights that is not some odd thing or not something that's anti-science or, or you either choose science or human rights. I think that's uh, important for all of us to, to um, engage in. And I, I won't go through all of this, but um, this is just Eleanor Roosevelt. So, so FDR's wife was, was one of the champions of human rights and, and really pushed through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights after World War um, to a very forceful woman and one interesting to read about. And, and this is basically, she, she talked about, uh, again, I won't read the whole thing, but where after all the, the universal human rights begin. And the point that she makes here is that they begin on a very individual basis. And, and so it's, it's not um, thinking that uh, you have to necessarily be tapped into huge networks. It's great if you are, if you choose to be, but thinking about this on an individual basis is extremely important. And I, and I, I always um, took comfort in something that Paul Farmer would talk about in fighting the good fight. And, and so, um, which means to me at least that you don't necessarily always win and you may even not believe you can win, but nevertheless being kind of on the right side of the fight. And, and I think being on the right side of promoting health and human rights is, is where we want and need to be. Um, where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm or office where he works. Such are the places where every man, woman and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerned citizen action to upload them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. Eleanor Roosevelt I will then end with a very shameless plug of uh, 
the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and which I'm privileged to be the president of this year. Um, I would encourage you, if you're interested in not only, of course, issues in health and human rights, but all the different things that people work on in the field of, of tropical medicine and global health, um, on the pathogen base of malaria and dengue and, and Ebola and everything else, but also on the programmatic side and, and the financial side and everything, um, I encourage you to look us up and, and to join us. Um, both as a member, but also at our annual meeting coming up in Chicago in a few months. And so I look forward to seeing you there. John and Kang Song, um, who's the founding director of Africa CDC and now the PEPFAR head and uh, global ambassador, will be our keynote speaker, a very moving and, and fascinating guy. Find www.tfindx.org. Daniel.bausch at findz.org. Daniel.bash at lshtm.ac.uk. Thank you. And so thanks very much for um, listening. And uh, I think we will go now to um, the, the questions here that I'm seeing in the, uh, the question and answer. I will do my best. The first question, um, while it's clear our technological capacity is expanding to better respond to crises, how do we ensure the delivery of those capacities to the communities that need it most? We often face a space age technology, stone age delivery. I love that. Um, can I use that issue when it comes to supporting health system, systems? So I think that that's that's well said, and there is no easy answer. But the the what I will say is um, the answer most often lies in the community. And when I look, for example, again um, in my field of viral hemorrhagic fevers. You know, we have been bad, at least over the years, we're getting better at recognizing that. And so when we see what really matters and what the answers are and implementation, that stone age, or, or sorry, that, that space age technology, you know, we come in and say, this is what has to be used in a particular way. And, and that's really never um, impactful and never really works. And so recognizing that for all disease and for all the things that plague us, whether it's temperatures or food insecurity or Ebola or COVID or, or, or whatever it may be, that the community is our partner and the community has ideas and, and um, we, we need to recognize that. And I, I think that's the way, and, and sometimes, um, sometimes you know, more or, or, or less space age technology is the right answer, but I think working in partnership with communities is the, is the right thing to do. Thank you, Steve, for that question. Um, and then Kavita, thanks for, uh, I'm glad you're enjoying the presentation. Um, uh, your question, I'm sorry, I may have missed the point. Wouldn't the addition of animal protection, ecological rights also be essential to the uh, consideration of human rights? I, what do animals rivers say? Um, completely, completely agree. And you know, what you're talking about there, Kavita, is essentially, I probably should have put it into the, into the presentation is really the one health approach, right? And so that we recognize that there's not a division in the health of our planet of healthy humans and healthy animals and healthy ecosystems, rivers, lakes, oceans, whatever it may be. Um, we're, we're all tied, of course. I, I think everybody in the line would say, you know, I know this um, and we do know this. And so it's probably not a, not a point that's novel, um, but I'll, I'll I'll state very clearly, you know, what, what I hope to do is inspire you in your career to kind of push this. Um, I don't know what stage, of course, I can't see who's online, but to, to really um, be an advocate for, for the, the human rights part of this, because um, that, that's, I think, one of the things that is not there. I think the recognition of One Health is there, but the recognition that um, sort of the underlying principle of human rights is, is the only way to make One Health really impactful um, for humans and animals is, is my point. But yeah, I do take your point, um, Carita. Feel free to um, put in more questions. Okay, <laughs> yes, that tools. Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks, Steve. Uh, Steve. Um, Full disclosure that space age technology, stone age delivery is not not his, but um, but Atul will go on to. And so so thanks for sharing that. It's just a reminder to all uh, 
people in the audience to put any questions you have into the Q&A box. Um, uh, Dr. Bosch will be able to answer them. Well, it appears, Mike, that I've either completely uh, completely answered all the questions and they're just completely, uh, as we say in French here, and uh, completely bowled over by um, the effectiveness of the presentation, or I've lost them completely. But um, Well, th thank you so much for the presentation, for uh, spending time with us, uh, and uh, with, with the... There is, Mike, sorry, yeah, there is um, one last question, or perhaps last question, mm -hmm. And from Jamie, um, can you please speak more on the expansion of point of care testing and global health? Sure, I'm happy to, Jamie. So there, there's a lot of amazing things that are coming out, and, and you know, so we have an opportunity. And maybe, Mike, I don't have the time in front of me with these different screens showing things, but I think we're okay on time, are we not? You have plenty of time. You have about 45 minutes. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so I, I went through, through things um, too fast as I usually do, but at any rate. Um, Thanks uh, for the, the comments that are coming in in the, in the uh, Q and A. So the expansion of point of care testing is so, so as I mentioned, you know, prior to COVID, we had very little point of care testing, and then now we have an opportunity because, first of all, point of care testing. There's no one on the planet who doesn't know what a point of care test is, right? Everyone has, uh, even if they don't know the name, you say, okay, that what's that test where you swab your nose and then you put a a dot of the liquid on that thing, that little cartridge, and wait for a line to show up. So I, I don't think there's a person in the, in the planet these days um, who doesn't know what the, the is. And so we have an incredible um, advance. And even people who don't know what point of care test is, they they still they, they know what a PCR is. They right? so that's the one okay that you have to go to the the lab, and so you have to wait 24 hours for that. And so you know some of these things are are changing incredibly, and, and so. Now they're developing point of care, um, relatively inexpensive point of care. We have lateral flow tests or like the, the common um, RDTs for COVID, but there's a lot of other point of care tests that are developing. And I mentioned it very briefly, but since we do have some time, I'll, I'll go through it a little bit more here. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of, there's a lot of promise in um, molecular point of care. And as I mentioned, you know, so, Apparatus that is about this big. If you can, you know, it looks it's smaller than a smaller than a basketball that sits on the desk, and in 45 minutes, um, give you an answer to seven different viruses for a few dollars. So these are really um, kind of potentially game-changing opportunities in uh, in detection of pathogens, both for pandemic threats and surveillance, and also for um, routine pathogens. And so there's still a lot of work to do, and we need to still get the cost down on some of those and figure out the use cases in lots of different settings. But where I think is the real value of this, and so it's not um, it's not even really for, for me about pandemic threats, even though that's the, the field that I work in. But I've seen after numerous outbreaks over the years that um, after an epidemic or a pandemic, people put in very strict surveillance and very vertically based surveillance for a particular thing. So if I think, for example, what, um, I don't mean to pick on them, but Public Health England, um, I spent four years being London based um, um, before Geneva, between Geneva, but, um, and so Public Health England after the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, put in various PCR laboratories for Ebola detection in Sierra Leone. And most of these diseases are after the outbreak of AIDS are relatively rare. So People test for Ebola for the next 10,000 or 20,000, 30,000, but after you do it for 50,000 or 100,000 or whatever it may be, people say, why would we bother doing this? And the, the funding and the reagents from Public Health England or from outside the country dry up. And you go back a few years later and the thermocyclers are in the, in the back collecting dust with some ice running around and, and those sorts of things. Many of you have, have seen this. And so the only real way to have lasting pandemic threats um, surveillance is to integrate it into the surveillance for more endemic diseases. And so now with some of the multiplex tests that we have, um, we're, we're able to think about that. And so what I mean by that is that can we envision 
a relatively low cost multiplex test for um, acute febrile illness that uh, the, the first targets are for malaria, typhoid fever, dengue. And so that's the first, you know, kind of common things. And then, uh, and then the seventh is, is for Ebola. And it's, uh, it turns out that it's actually not very expensive or, or problematic um, to add that lane that's for a relatively rare thing. Those reagents don't, don't cost a lot. And so then you have people who are investing as the patient, the healthcare provider, the, the surveillance officer, the minister of health are all interested in this because every day they want this to um, diagnose the malaria, the typhoid, the other things that they may see. And the, the 300,000 in first case, if someone says, oh, look at this, uh, that, the, that line for Ebola came up. This is really rare and we should contact someone. And so you, you get that without um, really expending more money for a separate surveillance system or a separate test. And that, that's our only opportunity for um, catching the the first case of these sorts of diseases. So there's a, a long ways to go, but nevertheless, a lot of promise there. And um, so this, these sorts of point of care testing um, is, uh, I think, really could, can change drastically um, uh, our, our world for pandemic threats, but drastically our world for endemic diseases as well. So I hope that um, went some ways to answering your question. I, I didn't get into the RDTs, but lots of RDTs that uh, can can of course be used at home and you don't even need to go to the primary health care center or anywhere. And so that, that's extremely important too. There are challenges in how do you collect the surveillance information from those. There are digital solutions from, it's probably again, less a, a scientific and technical challenge in some ways than it is um, social, political and economic ones. Um, Dr. Black, uh, I'll go to your question. There seems to be some discrepancies between the consumption and resources needed to provide aid and the urge to help places that are under-resourced. Is there some kind of octopus razor that simplifies this? Not quite sure how to answer this question, but um, I, I guess what I will say, you know, that we need to, uh, I mentioned it early, earlier, um, that so, you know, in, in my job, I've always talked about that we need to prepare for pandemics and um, depending upon the audience, there are people who uh, funders in the U.S. or the U.K. Or, or elsewhere who their primary interest and primary concern may be, OK, what happens if someone with Ebola comes to um, London? And their an old world way of thinking was that, OK, what I should do then um, is to kind of wait for that to happen and then I will respond. And the point that I always make is that even if you don't care what, what's happening in the DRC or West Africa or wherever there may be an Ebola outbreak, it's like if you come out of your home and you see that there's a fire raging down the street, your best opportunity to protect your house, not even thinking about your neighbors, is really not to wait at your door with a bucket of water and wait till it catches fire. It's to go down the street and put it out. And so um, by, by thinking that way that I hope we can convince people, I mean, I would say that we should be going down the street to put out the fire for ethical and moral imperatives. But even if you don't think about that strategically, even if we leave ethics aside, um, that's the right thing to do. And so we have some recognition of that right now, but we also have big challenges. And you know, again, since we have a little time, I think here, Mike, um, I'll state that we already have the challenges that even though people say we'll never forget when we have an epidemic or pandemic, of course they do. And um, resources are always tight. If you look what's happened in the world in the last year, I would say pandemic preparedness has already been kicked to number three in terms of funding of preparedness. And um, you can't necessarily disagree with this, but global warming has certainly become number one after this terrible summer around the world. Um, we were at uh, over 100 degrees here in Geneva a few um, weeks back, which is not common in previous times. Got a lot of snow last winter. Um, and uh, and so global warming has been become number one. Um, the war in Ukraine, I think, is two. And, and we're down to number three in terms of pandemic preparedness already. And there's only a finite amount of money in the world. So it is a, a challenging thing. And there's no easy answer. And of course, we have to be honest, there's no easy answer. In it, and it's not wrong to, of course, fund and be very concerned about uh, about global warming. So um, I know that wasn't very, uh, most of these are not very specific answers that I can give yes, no, but uh, those are my thoughts there. Um, I'll go on to the, the next 
uh, question here. What advice would you have for early career professionals that are interested in one health topics, especially the intersection of climate change and the rise of infectious diseases? So I think um, there are various One Health networks to tap into. And um, and so, um, so I, I think, so for example, I'm, I'm on the board of, of a One Health community. We'll have our annual meeting in Cape Town next year. I, I, I do understand the irony of the meeting where people fly to, uh, to a place. I um, haven't really figured out how to really drastically reduce my carbon footprint from flight and still trying to do my job. But there, there are various One Health networks that one can get in. And, and I think, you know, that's where you, you start early on. And, um, and then, you know, it's, it's steamrolled from there in terms of early career people. The, the, the next question is, what makes me less scared to do this work? It seems heroic and is what we are taught to do in med school, save lives and help the most needy. But then many of us get derailed. Is it because you understand science vaccines that you feel safe going into situations that could be dangerous? So, so thanks very much. I, I get this question a lot and I, I, don't, I don't consider myself um, any sort of hero. Um, I, you actually put it, uh, nailed it uh, exactly, you know, on the head of the nail. Um, it's not about vaccines. I did manage to get an Ebola vaccine um, a few years back during an outbreak, but I've been in a lot of outbreaks where there were no vaccines and still there's no vaccines for Lhasa and some of the other things. Um, but I think that, um, you know, I, I really just come back to the science and that's, um, when you see something happening that you see that can't be right, someone is in, is sick and, and, you, and people think, oh, this could be Ebola, but they had no exposure and what we know of Ebola, um, 99% of the time, um, what can't be right isn't right. And, and so you, it t- turns out to be something else. And so I respect the science. And I think of it, um, I'll, I'll, I'll confess that I'm not too much at the patient bedside anymore. I'm, I'm more kind of in the Ministry of Health office more than I'm you know, sort of at the bedside in any real dangerous area, but nevertheless um, was in the past and um, for for a long time. But I think respecting the science, and then I think of it as someone whose job entails, for example, um, parachuting out of an airplane. So if you respect the physics of that and you make sure that your parachute is checked and on in the right way, and then you can do things safely. And if and if you cut corners, then it could be dangerous. But I don't, I don't consider myself heroic in any way, but I can, I'm meticulous in, in terms of safety. Um, uh, Shirag, your, your question. Thanks. I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. Um, interested to get your thoughts on decision making under uncertainty. A lot of global health problems have a lot of uncertainty. Uncertainty is not only disease burden, but rapidly evolving diagnostics and guidance. Sometimes it is challenging to ensure that uncertainty does not get interpreted as uh, unawareness. What are your thoughts, suggestions on decision making under uncertainty, and how do we effectively communicate these ideas? Great question, very difficult question because the way that, um, and we've all seen this, that media is right now, is that there's not a lot of tolerance for uncertainty, even though it's a very normal thing. And so, especially when we look at at um, novel pathogens. So we, we have the expectation that people look to us and say, what is the truth? We wanna know how this is, um, for example, how this is transmitted and how lethal a particular pathogen is, and what different characteristics it has. And so the answers of course are not always um, readily available to us, especially something that's completely novel like SARS-CoV-2. And, and so you have, to, you have to work in a field with uncertainty, but you have to work with people who will if you say we have no evidence that it was um, transmitted person to person, if that's if there's data that comes out three days from now that shows that it was, even there was no evidence before, people will often be quite harsh with you and say, "Here's what's you know wrong. You're 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 wrong because <clears throat> you said it wasn't, and that and how it is." And so it's it's difficult to act in the in the area of uncertainty because we have such pressure basically to be right and, and there's it's not very forgiving for um and uh, as i say it's not even wrong it's just uh, expressing the best science and, and data that are available at, at a given time i think we can't nevertheless be um completely paralyzed by uncertainty we'll never know everything and so you have to move on with the best data that you can and the best evidence that you can and then and then express um honestly and, and transparently what uh, is the uncertainty that we have and that we don't know. 
you'll still get criticized, but nevertheless, um, I think it's the, the only choice you have and, and how to uh, how to, to try to deal with that. Um, so let's see, Gates, uh, any suggestions on experiences on trying to tackle diagnostics testing in countries where the government does not support public health labs, including funding policies, regulations, et cetera? Extremely difficult to do, of course, and it depends upon, I would say, whether the government is actively suppressive um, or just neglectful. Um, and so I've traveled and worked in a lot of countries where there's governments that have not been um, particularly supportive and sometimes been actively suppressive. What I've been impressed with is the scientists and public health workers um, can be extremely active even when the government is not. And, and so it depends really on what risk that they entail. And so many times you can have a, a president or a leader that says one thing, but people behind the scenes um, will, will really work hard to make things happen. And so finding those people to try to work with them, it depends, of course, you, you know, you, you can't do that if, um, there, if there's active suppression that puts them in danger or you in danger. So um, uh, not, not an easy thing to work with. Again, I, I would always counsel people to try to go as deep into the community for um, lessons as early on as you possibly can. That's easier said than done, I recognize, but I think it is where the answers usually lie and um, where the effective mitigations lie. Um, let me see. Uh, in relation to your point that answers lie within communities, I'm curious as to experience you've had in working with communities to generate solutions. Maybe what has worked well and lessons learned from times to others that have less successful experiences. There's lots of talk about localiz uh, localization or similar topics, but less sharing of what has tangibly looked like. Um, so, and thanks, I'm glad you enjoyed the, the talk. Um, I have to say, so my, my background is an infectious disease worker, and infectious disease doctor, and um, internal medicine. And then I uh, did a master's of, of public health and, and tropical medicine. So I don't profess to be an expert um, on the community engagement. I do profess, I guess, to be an expert on the recognition that we have to have that community engagement. So the, the, the things that I work on, for example, um, were just in the final phases of publishing some work for an Ebola vaccine trial that we did in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the, uh, a few years ago during the outbreak then. And so I'm not the one who's interacting directly with the community. In most cases, I'm interacting with social workers and social scientists who um, have the, the, the methodologies and, and the skills to do that. Um, also worked a lot with uh, very good social scientists in, when, I, when I lived in Peru and work in the Peruvian Amazon. So I'm probably not the person to give you the best tips, but I think um, my, my, my real tip is, is to get with um, advanced and, and intelligent social scientists um, who can, and, and there's now a, quite a quite a bit of civil um, society organizations and CSOs that can try to to guide you. Um, not sure, I feel like I missed some questions, but nevertheless, the one that I see there. Um, in your experience, have you seen the effectiveness of community health workers in educating underserved communities? about the importance of vaccines and promoting basic health related information as a preventive measure. Definitely so. And, I, and actually I think that um, community health workers and communities are the ones that ultimately curtail outbreaks. And so, but the, they have to believe. And so um, working with them very early on and answering frankly and transparently their questions and getting people to believe and then be a convert to the cause um, then they can be extremely effective, but I think you have to you have to start there. If you come in and said, "Okay, great, you're a community health worker. Here's what you have to do," um, that's probably not a formula for success. Alexia, um, what actions can one take to support health equity in the face of limited resources? I have a friend who wants to do Shaga's research, but it seems incredibly unethical to do surveillance and not to be able to connect people to affordable care when there is not completely understand. Um, and you know, so it's a challenge for all of us. And so you're you know, one of the areas that I work in obviously is diagnostics and you think, okay, well, great, we we can build a diagnostic tool for a given disease and come up with a diagnostic tool for, for LASA or whatever it may be, but we have no clear treatments for that. The one that we use, right, and actually the data are not particularly good about efficacy. It's 
still trials that need to be done. So, um, but but I think we have to start somewhere. And with all this, I think you have to start somewhere. So, so don't let the enormity of the task, either on the science or the human rights side, don't let that discourage you. Don't let that be something where you say, well, how much change can I make? Go back and, and uh, read the, the thing from Roosevelt and, and you know, the individual and the change that and everything starting on a very individual basis, which it was for her when she was a champion of, of the Universal Declaration. So um, I, I do understand. And but the other the other part of that is even for diagnostics or surveillance, that those data help us make the case, right? So one of the things for both in a public health way, but also um, if you go to the uh, the private sector and say, OK, we need you to develop a diagnostic assay for something. People, or we need you to develop a vaccine, they'll say, well, how many people actually have this disease? And so those early data, even though we don't have um, care for them, those can be extremely important. And if, if we look, for example, at, at HIV, so the HIV pandemic, you know, and for many years, we had very little to offer people and have very grim memories of being an infectious disease fellow. And everybody that I started seeing at the beginning of my fellowship was deceased before the before I finished, because there were just so few tools. But nevertheless, the, that testing and that um, surveillance to make the case of the enormity of the, of the problem was a, a very significant part of getting us to where we are now, where we have very effective therapies for HIV. They're not cured of yet, of course, but they're they're quite good in terms of suppressing um, opportunistic infections and virus. And, and we're we, we hope to get there with a vaccine, but, but I think um, that's you know, one of the reasons why, why I think we still need to push ahead, even if we can't have you know, the complete care pathway, um, we've checked off all the boxes. And there's one additional question from the chat um, asking for you to talk a little bit about uh, FIND that you work for and uh, the goals of FIND, and uh, if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. So FIND, as I mentioned, is an organization um, here in Geneva, a relatively young organization, about uh, 20 years old, um, started mostly focused on TB in a very technical um, way with the gene expert system. And then, especially with COVID, blossomed into a much broader organization. And so FIND works um, on end-to-end -end diagnostics. And so there's very technically oriented people who know how to, um, you know, who are engineers, and, biological engineers and uh, or others who have worked in industry who know how to make a make a test. Um, there's people who understand the, the regulatory issues that uh, are required. And, and then there's people like me who don't know those things. I've, not, I've worked in some degree of diagnostic development, but I'm, I'm not an expert on the technical side of those things in terms of really, you know, microfluidics and those sorts of things. But then we think, okay, well, let's, you know, how do we put this test into the field for, for maximum impact? And then um, we've really broadened out over the last few years. I've only been at Fine for for a couple of years, and, and actually um, we'll be moving on. Not not because I'm anti Fine in any way, but just the uh, next opportunities relatively soon. But um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, we're really working a lot on, on access and advocacy issues in terms of access to care, which I emphasize. So yeah, um, feel free to look us up on the. Um, you can see there's the, the website for FIND. It's, um, if you have any questions, feel free to have my emails there, both for at FIND and, and uh, I still carry an appointment at the, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for where I was um, worked there for a number of years. So, um, yeah, feel free to, to inquire. Um, I'm seeing one more question here coming in from Jamie. Do you happen to have any insight on finding ethical gems or jewelry? I'm just wondering if there's something I could do to not support civil wars and mining outbreaks. You know, it's it's really hard, Jamie, to be perfect, right? And so, um, you know, like we all we all know that um, driving a car is something that's not very good for the planet, right? And what we all recognize, I bet there's a lot of people here who drive a car. I don't drive a car here in Geneva, but that's just because um, Geneva is so good for, for public transport and I ride a bike. But um, when I lived in the U.S., it's been a while now since I have, but um, you know, I, I did. So I, I think you, I think you um, as I mentioned before, you, you don't get um, discouraged by the enormity of the task. Uh, and uh, this is just, I guess, my philosophy on life. You, know, you try to try to, of course, chip off the things that you can do better. Um, and that interest you and, and fit with your life and your needs. And then, and then I, I think also um, 
an awareness of, of that most of most of us live in kind of the the very small. Um, even if you don't consider yourself rich, you probably are. If you're on the line here, you're probably one of the rich people on the planet and recognizing that and then trying to, to respond and advocate in, in the way that you can, but without being too harsh on yourself. It's, it's not all about the individual. The systems, of course, are, you know, a uh, challenge most people to try to go to the grocery store and, and buy no plastic unless you have two days of your week um, to, to try to shop in that way, it's quite difficult to do, but you can go to the grocery store and limit your plastic. And, and so you don't, it doesn't have to be 100% good. It can be 80% good. And, and I think I'm feeling that you're, you're an advocate for the right thing is at least how um, I, I won't try to preach to all of you any more than I've already preached tonight, but, um, but at least that, that's kind of my philosophy on life. CDC, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Great. Well, well, thank you so much. Uh, I see there's no more questions, um, but I want to thank you and thank all of our attendees uh, for an excellent presentation. Um, you can please join us again next month um, for the next Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds, which will be on uh, October 4th. Um, and uh, I thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone. A pleasure to talk with you. Bye-bye.